Thank you very much for your introduction and thanks for the kind invitation to present to you um, a revisit of the momentous discovery of insulin in Toronto in 1921, 1922. And I'm particularly interested and will share with you some of the lessons from that discovery that are still relevant for the modern era. I would like to acknowledge the work done by two historians, the late uh, Professor Michael Bliss and uh, Chris Ruddy. Um, I have drawn quite heavily on their work and um, I really wanted to thank them for that. So this was diabetes before insulin. It was shocking, it was universally uh, fatal and uh, tragically it often affected uh, children, uh, mostly affected children, uh, adolescents, young adults. And uh, the, these terrible uh, pictures look like concentration camp survivors. They would waste away uh, a loss of both body fat and muscle tissue and develop something called ketoacidosis. Um, there was really no treatment. Um, many diets were tried. Uh, many kinds of uh, treatments, nothing was successful before the discovery of insulin. Um, this is a wonderful quote from Michael Bliss from his famous book, The Discovery of Insulin, and I'll read it to you. The discovery of insulin at the University of Toronto in 1921-1922 was one of the most dramatic events in the history of the treatment of disease. Insulin's impact was so sensational because of the incredible effect it had on diabetic patients. Those who watch the first start, sometimes comatose, patients with diabetes receive insulin and return to life saw one of the genuine miracles of modern medicine. They were present at the closest approach to the resurrection of the body that our secular society can achieve and at the discovery of what has become the elixir of life for millions of human beings around the world. So discoveries rarely come out of the blue, of course, and what was the body of knowledge localizing insulin to the pancreas prior to 1921. Well, uh, Paul Langerhans in, 19, in 1869 was uh, studying the pathology of the pancreas. And uh, he discovered these clusters of cells in the pancreas, subsequently became known as the islets of Langerhans. And these were floating in the pancreas. So the pancreas is this organ that sits behind the stomach and in front of the spine. And um, most of the pancreas actually consists of these asinine, and asini uh, glands that make enzymes, and the enzymes travel through these little ducts, which then coalesce to become a single large pancreatic drug duct, and then takes the enzymes um, to the first part of the intestine called the duodenum, and these enzymes are responsible for food digestion. So the pancreas consists of sort of these two parts, the asini, which make enzymes, for food digestion, and then Paul Langerhans did not know the function of these islets, um, and um, these became the focus of activity over the next few years. Um, but right back to 1889 and 1893, investigators started to hone in on this pancreas and did, did experiments in dogs, and they reproduced the diabetic state by removing the pancreas from dogs, and they hypothesized that this was due to loss of an internal secretion of the pancreas rather than the pancreatic exocrine secretion. Actually, they performed many experiments, some of which were partially successful in reducing um, the glucose, and they measured the glucose in the urine, so they made the dog diabetic by removing their pancreas, and um, when the blood sugar rises, it spills over into the urine and can be detected there. And so they were measuring, and then they, they were making an extract of the pancreas and injecting it back into the dogs and uh, looking at how the dog did, and they had partial success. In fact, um, over the next two decades, even a number of experiments were done in humans, injecting this extract into humans, but uh, the human experiments totally without success. Um, Lionel Opie, working at Johns Hopkins in um, 1901, was looking at pathology specimens, looking at the pancreas uh, from individuals who had diabetes and died of diabetes, and he noticed inflammation in the islets of Langerhans in these individuals. So he drew this uh, pathological connection between diabetes and damage to the islets of Langerhans. 
And many investigators uh, worked on this in the next uh, two, uh, two to three decades. I mentioned Minkowski and Meering, Hayden, uh, Rennie and Fraser, Zulsa, Scott, Kleiner and Meltzer, and Paulescu uh, from Romania. And in fact, they had variable success. And, uh, Paulescu published his results right at the time that Banting and Best were starting their experiments, and he had success in lowering the glucose in dogs. Um, in fact, there was uh, a, a controversy that went on for many, many years after the awarding of the Nobel Prize in uh, 1923, when many felt that Paul Lasker was overlooked and should also have shared the, the Nobel Prize uh, with the Toronto group. Um, and we'll talk about that uh, a little bit more. But certainly, um, the work of the Toronto group was not, uh, did not come out of the blue and really was based on a large body of work isolating an important internal secretion to the pancreas. So Banting was a uh, struggling surgeon um, working in a town that called London, Ontario. It's 200 kilometers uh, west of Toronto. Uh, he was really struggling to set up a clinical practice and he was giving some lectures and he actually read some interesting articles. And the story goes that he woke up at two o'clock in the morning and jotted down this idea from his readings. And uh, you can see the original um, uh, memo that he wrote. And what it says is ligate the pancreatic duct of, duct of dogs. Um, so ligate means to uh, sever or tie off or to cut, um, keep dogs alive until the asini. Remember the asini are the part that uh, secrete the digestive enzymes. So wait for those to degenerate, leaving just the islets of Langerhans. And after that, try to isolate the internal secretion from the islets so that it would not be destroyed by these pancreatic enzymes. So this was Banting's idea, or one could call it his hypothesis. And we'll talk about a hypothesis a little in a little while. Uh, it turns out that it was not correct. And in fact, uh, there were a number of, uh, of uh, uh, misconceptions or errors in this, but uh, most important of all is that the um, duct, the pancreatic duct does not have to be ligated in order to isolate this internal secretion. So Banting was, uh, spoke to this, uh, spoke about this to some of his colleagues and was encouraged to go to Toronto, the University of Toronto, to speak to a famous carbohydrate researcher, J.J.R. McLeod. I'll show you his picture in the next slide. But the University of Toronto was actually a fantastic place to do experiments of this uh, type. Uh, not only was McLeod there with uh, very established labs and uh, and uh, know-how in the area of carbohydrate metabolism. But in fact, the, the medical school uh, building um, housed a very established and uh, research-oriented um, uh, medical faculty. The Toronto General Hospital, where I currently work, uh, was across the street. And um, that is where the first injection of insulin uh, was given to a human. The Hospital for Sick Children across the street from that uh, where many of these children were admitted to hospital with uh, type 1 diabetes. And very importantly, the Connaught Antitoxin Lab, which was actually uh, created in, in 1914 during the war to create diphtheria, diphtheria antitoxin. And the Connaught Antitoxin Lab was in the basement of the medical school, it became very, very important in the, um, uh, in the early production of insulin. So this is J.J.R. McLeod. He was a native of Scotland, and uh, he was the head of the Department of Physiology, and he had a lot of resources at hand. And Banting, the surgeon from London, Ontario, came to speak to him. He was uh, uh, very skeptical initially of Banting's idea, but he did relent, and he gave Banting uh, resources um, uh, to start his experiments in 1921. So this is the, the lab. He gave him dogs to do the experiments on. He also uh, gave him the assistance of an undergraduate, um, uh, a graduate student, uh, Charlie Best, um, to work with Banting. This antiquated um, uh, equipment uh, 
to measure blood glucose or, uh, is actually very important because although it is very dated, obviously, it actually gave these ex experimenters a huge leg up on those who were previously doing experiments. So being able to measure glucose in small adequates of blood and repeated samples uh, much more precisely than any of their predecessors could do. They started the experiments in May 1921, and lo and behold, by, 90, by August that same year, they started to have this um, success. So here you can see the chart of the blood glucose of a dog that was uh, administered this. Uh, so what they did was they ligated the pancreatic ducts, they waited four to seven weeks, they took the um, pancreas up, they mashed up, up the pancreas, they purified and tried to isolate this internal secretion. They gave it back to a, pan, uh, to a dog that had had its pancreas removed and was very sick and diabetic. And you can see this reduction in the blood glucose of the dog and Banting's um, uh, lab notes as well. So success by very early, I can tell you as a researcher, and many of you uh, listening to this have, have done your own research, and this certainly never happened to me. Uh, it takes years often to get uh, results and not quite as, as stunning as these results. Um, so late in 1921, um, there was a uh, biochemist, very, very skilled biochemist by the name of Collip, and he was on sabbatical from the University of Alberta, on sabbatical in uh, McLeod's lab. And he had some experience in, in purifying, um, uh, you know, um, secretions and um, he actually got to work. Uh, so McLeod asked him to become involved in this project in about November or December of 1921. And he used an alcohol extraction method. And, uh, you know, it's like baking a cake, you know, uh, it's got to be just right. So making the exact percentage of alcohol, approximately 90% to extract the impurities and, and leave the active substance uh, in solution and change the pH this way and that way, he started to inject this uh, extract into rabbits, which was much, much quicker and less expensive than doing it into dogs. And they felt they had a good um, extract by early 1922. So Leonard Thompson, a young boy, 14 years old, didn't look like this at the time, was very, very sick. Um, he had ketoacidosis, he was wasted, just like the pictures I showed you. And um, on the 11th of January, they gave him an extract, uh, very large volumes uh, into each butter, very painful, um, actually developed uh, sterile abscesses at the site of injection and had no, no effect. So they went back to Collip and they said, you know, you, you got to work harder, you got to clean up this uh, extract and give us a more purified uh, solution, which he did. And on January the 23rd, gave this uh, new formulation to Leonard Thompson with excellent res results, in this case, looking at reductions in uh, glucose in the urine. So that was the first successful administration of this pancreatic extract to a human. Uh, Leonard Thompson started to perk up, he felt better, he was less sick, and over time received these insulin injections, gained weight, and looked like that later on. Um, the press started, uh, got uh, caught um, whiff of what was happening and were very excited. Here is a, um, a headline from the Toronto Daily Star, now called The Star. Um, Toronto doctors on track of diabetes cure. Diabetes work, epoch making, save physicians. So we've drawn this timeline of exactly where in the discovery of insulin uh, did the work of this Toronto group, Banting, Best, McLeod, and Collar. Where did it fit in? And this was in 1921 and early 1922. Well, I've already told you about the work of Paul Langerhans, um, discovering what became known as the islets of Langerhans, and then the work of, oh, I won't name them all again, but all of these are outstanding. Uh, um, investigators who honed in on the pancreas with greater and greater success leading up to the work in Toronto. But in actual fact, this was not really the discovery of insulin. It was the purification of insulin to, um, to a level that it could be safely administered to humans and cure their diabetes uh, 
But the discovery involves more than that. It involves uh, discovering the uh, amino acid uh, sequence of the protein of the peptide, insulin, which came later, the genetic uh, code of um, the insulin gene, um, how insulin is secreted from the cell, and even this, and these were Nobel Prizes that were subsequently awarded over the century, following this purification of insulin. I'll just mention Rosalind Diallo working uh, um, on the radio immunoassay, uh, which was a very important discovery in the 1960s, allowed investigators to then measure these minute quantities of insulin in the blood and begin to really understand its uh, secretion and its action. So many other discoveries following the work of the uh, Toronto 4, uh, which were critical in the actual discovery of insulin. Um, so the question comes up, what was the 1921-1922 work in Toronto the true discovery of insulin? And I've told you that not really, it was actually the purification, but what is well beyond dispute is that Banting, Best, Collip, and McLeod were the first to develop an insulin preparation as an effective therapy for humans affected by diabetes, and no other investigators or groups can lay claim to that accomplishment. So what were the Toronto researchers' success factors compared to their predecessors who made great advances over the previous three decades? Well, firstly, um, as I've indicated to you, there was a large body of knowledge that had already localized an internal secretion to the pancreas. Secondly, Banting was not simply a curious researcher. In fact, you could hardly even call him a researcher, but he wanted, he had no training in that field, but he wanted to, if possible, isolate a form of internal secretion that will be of use in treating diabetes. His drive, sheer determination, perseverance, and a laser-like focus on developing a successful treatment for diabetes was really the success factor. Um, I already mentioned there were advances in determination of blood glucose. They could measure it much more precisely. In fact, it's entirely possible that their predecessors had more success than they, th than they thought they had or they knew they had if they could have measured glucose more successfully, uh, more precisely. Banty and Best worked with a very experienced carbohydrate researcher, McLeod, in a well-resourced resourced research university. And the experienced and brilliant biochemist, Collip, um, optimized the alcohol extraction method to isolate insulin relatively free of toxic impurities. So really, all four of them uh, played a very important role and contributed to the success. And as I'll mention, um, once they had discovered insulin, there was now a huge need. People were dying, children were dying, and everybody needed insulin. And this is where the collaboration with industry was very important to scale up production. So I'm quite interested in this. It's a very common pitfall. We see it all the time, okay? I've probably been guilty of this on more than one occasion. And it is the believing one's hypothesis to the point that it impairs judgment. So we come up with an idea. We think it's a brilliant idea. And um, it's very important in research that it's not the idea. You can think of any idea you want, but it's the testing of that idea. So I can tell you, you know, interacting with trainees, and uh, many of you may have had the same experience, often you'll hear a trainee say, we set out to prove the hypothesis. And you have to stop them and say, no, 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 that is actually not what you were doing. You were not trying to prove the hypothesis. You were testing the hypothesis. And in actual fact, more technically, you're testing the null hypothesis. So the hypothesis or the idea may be right or it may be wrong, it doesn't really matter. Everything you do is gonna be an advance to science. But um, this was a classic case of Banting believing his hypothesis or his idea to the point that it actually blinded him. So what really happened was towards the latter part of 1921, they had lots of delays in generating duct ligated dogs. It took 47 weeks and they were running out of extract and they needed to do these, what, what's called longevity experiments in dogs. Dogs were made diabetic, and what, that, what McLeod wanted them to do was not just lower the blood glucose once with a single injection, but administer the, this extract, which came to be known as insulin, uh, 
on a repeated basis to keep the dogs alive. And they, they were running out of the uh, extract because it took too long. So they began to use the pancreas from only partially degenerated pancreas, and they actually had some good results. And, but however, this is the point that I wanted to make here, is at first they actually failed to recognize their own findings. And uh, in, fact, um, in fact, I'll just go back a little bit, they failed to recognize, and so in a subsequent publication, they claimed that the duct ligated pancreas worked better uh, more effectively than that, that that was not degenerated. Um, but that was not true. It was not indicated in their uh, findings. And Banting read a uh, paper um, towards the end of uh, 1921 showing that newborn or fetal pancreas had more plentiful islets. Um, they actually obtained pan uh, fetal pancreas from a local abattoir with very good success. So they started to pivot away from uh, doing what they thought they had to do, which was ligate the pancreatic duct. And finally, they resorted to using a pancreas of non-ligated adult pancreas from a dog with a very successful decline in blood glucose. So now the race was on to supply insulin to the world. And uh, okay, you can imagine the stress. And this is where the Connaught Labs came in, and it's very primitive insulin production in the early days in the uh, basement of the medical school building. This is an old uh, insulin vacuum still. And uh, to the rescue came industry. Okay, so uh, Eli Lilly in Indianapolis and Klaus, who was um, uh, from Indo Eli Lilly, caught wind of the uh, Toronto experiments earlier in 1921 and was interested in it and was following it. And so he made contact with the Toronto uh, researchers and they came to an agreement that Lilly would assist and would uh, produce insulin um, um, and would make it available for all of those who, who needed it in, in the first year at uh, simply at cost. And uh, in actual fact, uh, huge advances were made in the manufacture of insulin because there were failures at the Connaught Lab in 1922. They could not supply uh, the world with insulin. And uh, there were, uh, for example, the isoelectric focusing was a huge advance and the purification of insulin. And uh, by 1923, uh, Lilly was able to uh, manufacture and supply at least all of North America. And uh, um, the Toronto group also licensed uh, the uh, insulin to the Royal Society in the UK and to the, uh, um, the beginnings of what has now become a, uh, a, a global leader, the Nova Nordisk, the, the, the early uh, Nova Nordisk uh, uh, group in Denmark as well. Um, there was spreading excitement uh, encouraged by Leonard Thompson's progress and clinical trials were beginning in select places in Toronto, in Boston, in a few places. And you had these uh, resurrections, these wonderful uh, uh, success stories of the little girl who looked like that and then after months of treatment looked like that, much, much better, healthier. And Banting really uh, became the superstar New York excited over new cure for diabetes, gives Banting all the credit, etc. And these wonderful stories uh, to the doctor who cures diabetes from a young girl um, who was uh, saved by insulin. Some of the early uh, uh, patients were famous. So Elizabeth Hughes was the daughter of the Secretary of State uh, of the United States. Wonderful a young girl um, who was one of the early uh, patients and many of the others here. And, uh, you know, making insulin at a lower price was very important. The price actually declined uh, from 1922 to 1942. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about what happened subsequent to that. Um, this is the staff of the Connaught Lab. And uh, this is one of the early insulin vials from the Connaught Labs. Um, why did the discoverers of insulin, this is well known, they, they chose not to profit personally from the discovery. What was that all about? So the discoverers sold their rights to the University of Toronto for $1 a piece, and the university filed an application for a patent. They felt that providing their patent to the university would prevent their discovery from being commercially exploited by a single company. And justification for filing a patent 
was that when the details of the method of preparation were published, anyone would be free to prepare the extract, but no one would secure a profitable monopoly. And they were, the discoverers were very reluctant to be associated with patenting on ethical grounds that commercialization might make their discovery unavailable on a widespread basis. Banting famously declared that insulin does not belong to me, it belongs to the world. They had very high ethical concern that ensured that even the most financially destitute of patients would not be deprived of insulin by commercial forces. And the discovery of insulin provided a formative test case for the relationship between academia and industry. And unlike today, in which commercialization of medical discoveries is a point of pride for researchers in universities, in 1921-22, researchers in universities felt uneasy about profiting from medical discoveries, which were first and foremost to benefit humanity. So 100 years after its discovery, insulin is still unavailable, unfortunately, to millions of people in need. Globally, one in two people uh, needing insulin lack access. Improving insulin availability and for affordability is complicated. It needs to be addressed through national and global actions, including prioritizing the supply of more affordable human insulin, increasing competition through the use of lower priced quality assured biosimilars, negotiating lower prices from manufacturers and improving distribution systems. The WHO Global Report on Diabetes in 2016 states that people with diabetes who depend on life-saving insulin pay the ultimate price when access to affordable insulin is lacking. This was one of the fastest uh, Nobel Prize awarding, um, awardings. Um, it was awarded in 1923. Uh, just uh, just over a year, about a year and a half after the first successful human administration. And it was interesting that uh, the names Banting and Best, of course, are most, most associated with the discovery of insulin. But in fact, the Nobel Prize was awarded to Banting and McLeod. Now, by then, there was uh, some acrimony between Banting and McLeod, and Banting immediately split his award with Charlie Best and McLeod split it with Collip, and in the end, um, with all four of them benefiting from this award, uh, it was probably the uh, correct uh, attribution because all four played a very important role. And uh, finally, just to say that it's not as if nothing's happened over the last hundred years. So there's been tremendous advances with purification and concentration of insulins modified insulins that have delayed absorption. This makes it very helpful in the treating of diabetes. Um, advances in glucose self-monitoring, which you're gonna uh, hear about as well. Uh, very, very interesting, big advances over the next uh, uh, century. Um, discovery of other ways to monitor how the person with diabetes is going, something called the hemoglobin A1C, which measures uh, the last three month average glucose in the blood improved insulin delivery advices, pens and infusion pumps, manufacture of the first human insulin in the 1980s, a major advance, and ultra rapid and ultra long acting insulins, as well as continuous glucose monitoring. However, there, uh, uh, there are still many uh, uh, challenges for the person who needs to take insulin for the rest of their life. And the holy grail will be, we're very, very close to this, almost there, actually it even exists, um, which is what's called a closed loop device, a pump that infuses the insulin under the skin and it can be programmed to infuse just the right amount and continuous glucose monitoring device, which was a big engineering uh, hurdle that has been um, uh, overcome and that can give continuous glucose readings and then the connection of the two by an algorithm, algorithm, a mathematical algorithm that can say, here's the sugar, here's how much insulin uh, to deliver, a sort of a plug and play artificial pancreas. And I can tell you that the delays, are because it takes billions of dollars to have these devices um, approved by regulatory authorities, and many people with diabetes are not waiting for that. They've actually jerry-rigged their own um, uh, a closed loop, we call this a closed loop system, they're not approved, so we can't uh, endorse this, 
but many people already with diabetes are using closed loop systems. And then of course, cell-based therapy. So if we can take a stem cell and make it into a cell that makes insulin like these ones and transplant them into the body, that can be almost as good as, an, or as a uh, pancreas that's not diseased. And uh, finally, uh, thank you very much for your attention. This presentation was based on a uh, paper that uh, I wrote with my colleague uh, Patricia Brubaker, professor in the Department of Physiology at the University of Toronto, and uh, the publication date for this in the Journal of Clinical Investigation is January 4th, uh, 19, uh, 2021. And thank you very much for your attention.